There is nothing worth living for unless it is worth dying for. My grandmother lived a life devoted to Jesus, and today her talks have been made available in their original form. So you too can be built up through the insights and mysteries God revealed to her throughout her ministry. Now, without further ado, here is Elizabeth Elliot. Things have happened in my own life which have raised the questions again and again. But of course, this is the rock that never moves. And Jesus Christ is indeed Lord of my life, and I give testimony to his faithfulness. It's only our human weakness, our foolishness, our doubts that bring these hard, horrible questions into our minds. We are not indeed at the mercy of chance, mishap, calamity, misfortune, disaster, catastrophe, undesigned and unintended. Is that really the way it is? No. God does know exactly what he's doing, and he's got the whole world in his hands. And I want to read a quotation from the man named St. Francis de Sales, who lived in the 17th century. He was a very wise man and must have gone through all sorts of trials and tribulations. And I'm greatly helped and, and fed spiritually by the old saints. I'm old myself, but I like to go back generations and uh, hundreds of years because I find such profound wisdom in these old writers. And this is what the sales says about some of those doubts. Strive to see God in all things without exception and acquiesce in his will with absolute submission. Do everything for God, uniting yourself to him by a mere upward glance or, or by the overflowing of your heart towards him. Never be in a hurry. Do everything quietly and in a calm spirit. I don't think I will ask for a show of hands of those of you who could fulfill that. <laughs> Never be in a hurry. Do everything quietly and with a calm spirit. Do not lose your peace for anything whatsoever, even if your whole world seems upset. Commend all to God, and then lie still and be at rest in his bosom. Whatever happens, abide steadfast in a determination to cling simply to him, trusting to his eternal love for you. And if you find that you have wandered forth from this shelter, recall your heart quietly and simply. Maintain a holy simplicity of mind and do not smother yourself with a host of cares, wishes, or longings under any pretext. I went to Ecuador in 1952, thrilled that God had indeed called me to be a missionary. All my life, as, as long as I can remember, from the time I was about two or three years old, I suppose, I hoped and prayed that God would give me the privilege of being a foreign missionary. I come from a missionary family. My parents were missionaries. Five out of the six of us children have been missionaries. And that was my great hope, desire, and ambition. It wasn't until my junior year in college that it suddenly dawned on me that I really had not consulted God about whether he wanted me to be a missionary. I had just told him that that's what I wanted to be. But between my junior and senior years, I got down to business on my knees and said, Lord, was this just my idea, or is this indeed what you are calling me to do? And it was through circumstances, through godly counselors, older people whom I trusted, and of course, the Word of God, these three things combined, convinced me that God had indeed called me. I didn't know where it was that God wanted me to go. I thought I was to go to Africa, but through various providences, God led me to Ecuador. 
And so, of course, I went first to the capital city where I had to learn the language, Spanish, which is the national language, of course. And then I was invited by two British women missionaries who had been struggling in the western jungle of Ecuador with a language that they had not been able to crack. It was spoken by the people called Colorados. And you Spanish speakers, of course, know that Colorado means red, and it was a very apt name because these people painted themselves literally bright red from head to toe. But their language had never been reduced to writing, and I was told that no one had ever learned their language except the Colorado Indians themselves. So, of course, my first job was to try to find someone who might be able to help me with the language, although I was assured that there wasn't anybody except the Indians themselves who didn't speak very much Spanish. And so, of course, I prayed. We three prayed, the other two women from England and I prayed that God would somehow furnish a helper. And God answered that prayer far beyond anything we had asked. It turned out that there was a man by the name of Macario who was out of a job at, the, at that particular time. He was willing to work for me at my price, which was very low. He was a speaker of both Colorado and Spanish. I learned that he was not an Indian, but he had grown up with Indian children, and so he spoke both languages fluently. Then on top of all of those amazing qualifications, I discovered that he was a Christian and thrilled to have the opportunity of participating in what he believed was the foundational work for the translation of the Bible. And so Macario and I began to work very happily together. He would spend about one hour or so in the morning with me, and then that would take me the rest of the day to analyze whatever I had learned from his talking the Colorado language and sometimes interpreting for me. Everything worked wonderfully well. It took me probably five or six hours to, trans to analyze the one hour that I had spent with Macario. But that's the way you do an unwritten language. I knew that that was my job. But one morning, I was in my bedroom reading my Bible when I read a passage from 1 Peter 4 that says, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you, as though some strange thing happened. It happens to give you a share in Christ's sufferings. And at that point, I heard gunshots. There was nothing unusual about that at all. The white men who lived in the clearing where we lived hunted with guns, and the Indians had long since learned the value of guns, and so the Colorado Indians also hunted with guns. But these particular gun shots were followed by people screaming and horses galloping and general pandemonium. Of course, I jumped up and rushed out to see what was happening. And I found that Macario had just been murdered. Now, this was only about perhaps six or eight weeks after he and I had begun our work together. And I knew that there was no one else qualified as Macario was. And it certainly was one of those occasions, perhaps the first really painful occasion, when I was tempted to say, is God still in charge? And of course, there's that three-letter word that all of us probably at one time or another have asked God. Why? Why would God permit the one and only man in the whole world who could speak Colorado in Spanish, why would God allow him to be murdered? And as I looked at that corpse and these horrifying thoughts rose in my mind, I felt as if I was looking into a deep abyss from which there was no echo, no light, no answer. I realized then that I had two choices. Either God is God, and he knows exactly what he's doing, 
or he's not God, and we're all at the mercy of chance. I think you can guess which I chose, otherwise I would not have been here tonight. There wasn't any question in my mind that God did know what he was doing, but it seemed so strange, so incomprehensible. And as one little girl said, sometimes I don't understand God. Well, who of us would ever claim to understand God? He is sovereign. He is inscrutable. He is the Lord of the universe. And he engineers things according to his wisdom, his secret wisdom, which he does not explain to us necessarily. I began to wonder at times, did I come here by accident? Am I in the wrong place? Did I miss the way? Could I have helped it? Is somebody else responsible for this mess I'm in? Now, these were not all questions that arose as a result of the death of Macario, but these were questions that had arisen from time to time in my life. And I dare say that there may be some here tonight who would have asked the same questions. I don't know what mess you might be in right now or what incomprehensible thing God might have permitted in your life. But we do question, don't we? Can you imagine the questions that most have, must have run through Joseph's mind in all those years when he was in prison? That faithful man, Joseph, who had been hated by his brothers, dropped into a pit, then they were going to murder him, then they discovered that they could make some money on him, and so they sold him, and he was taken into Egypt, and he was put in Potiphar's house, and he was lied about by Potiphar's wife. Consequently, he went to prison. And for years and years and years, it appears as though God was paying no attention at all. Surely, Joseph must have asked this question, is God still in charge? It's in exactly this kind of a place that God wants to turn our eyes to him and teach us that he is in charge, that he loves us with an everlasting love, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he's not going to let us go. I went back in my mind to my age eight, when my father came home one day with a newspaper which reported that a missionary couple by the name of John and Betty Stam had been beheaded by Chinese communists. This was, of course, a tremendous shock to all of us. It had a very deep impact in my eight-year-old mind because Betty Scott, just before she became John Stam's wife, had sat at our dinner table. I couldn't believe that God would allow two missionaries to have their heads chopped off by Chinese communists. But there were the pictures, and there was the newspaper. When I was 12 years old, well, first I guess I should say that one might suppose that a child who wanted to be a missionary would be turned off by an incident like that, but it had the opposite effect. It made me all the more determined that I wanted to be that kind of a missionary, the kind that God could do anything he wanted with. And about four years later, when I was about 12, I discovered a prayer that Betty Scott Stam had written. And I copied it into the back of my Bible. I still have that Bible. And she wrote these words, Lord, I give up all my own plans and purposes, all my own desires and hopes, and accept thy will for my life. I give myself, my life, my all, utterly to thee to be thine forever. Fill me and seal me with thy Holy Spirit. Use me as thou wilt. Send me where thou wilt. And work out thy whole will in my life at any cost, now and forever. And those three words, at any cost, were just indelibly marked in my mind, in my heart, as a 12-year-old. I wanted to be that kind of a missionary, the kind that could say, Lord, do anything you want with me. 
at any cost, now and forever. I'm sure I probably thought it would be wonderful if God would let me have my head chopped off. But God did not choose to do that in my case. He had some other things in mind for me. But these experiences, think now what has been yours. What is it that God is saying? What is it you're saying? Are you saying, Lord, are you still in charge? Are you up there? Are you paying attention? Have you forgotten about me? This is the very place in which God wants to turn our eyes to him. And if we've never paid a whole lot of attention before, God does manage to get our attention, doesn't he, when th everything seems to fall apart. We don't know where to go or what to do. And he's saying, lo, I'm with you all the days. And he's not going to let go. This is the very place meant by God to turn our eyes to him. And when I say meant, does that mean that it was planned that this thing was going to happen? Was it by chance? Was it by divine design? Well, I read in Romans 8, 28, everything that happens fits into a pattern for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. I knew that verse by, by heart, but I'm not sure that I had memorized the next verse quite as early as I memorized Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 29 explains why. Have you studied that? It says that we might be shaped to the image of his son. Clear as crystal. That's why all these things that we can't understand and about which we want to say, why, Lord? These are all part of a pattern that fits together in order that we, you and I, might be shaped to the image of his son. Now, what does it take to shape an image? Michelangelo made it sound very simple. He said, you take a block of marble and you knock off anything that doesn't look like David. <laughs> but it takes a hammer and chisel and file, a lot of hammer blows. And by the time you get to be with my, my age, you've had a few hammer blows. Maybe you're 10 years old and you've had some hammer blows. What is God up to? Then, of course, the chippings of the chisel are not quite so hard as the hammer blows, but they sure do hurt. And then there are, the, there are those little raspings of every day to get those sharp corners and those sharp edges off. He's shaping you and me into the image of Jesus Christ. And God knows exactly what it takes to shape Elizabeth Elliot into the image of Jesus Christ, and he knows exactly what it takes to bring each one of you to that place through a totally different set of circumstances. He knows us by name. He calls us by name. But he wants to teach us to trust him. And I want to read to you some very wise words by a writer named Romano Guardini. He's speaking of the Lord's death of Christ having to go to the cross. He says, we have often spoken of the must which led the Lord to his death. Remember that Jesus had said to his disciples, I must go up to Jerusalem and I must be killed. And when Jesus says, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, he does not look as he speaks at mankind in general, but at me. Everyone who hears Jesus speak of the necessity of the road to Jerusalem should substitute his own name for the scribes and the Pharisees. That necessity is woven of the eternal Father, of Jesus and his mission, and of me. 
all that I am and do, not a distant nation a long, long time ago. It is I, with all my indifference, my refusals and failings, who strap the cross of Christ to his shoulders. Do we disapprove of a God who tolerates pain and evil? Are we still willing to place our complete trust that he does know what he's doing? One of the hymns that we used to sing quite often in our family devotions at home was trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And he's not going to explain himself. He's not going to give us visions and handwriting on the wall and stars of Bethlehem and pillars of fire. He doesn't seem to do very much of that anymore, does he? But he says, will you love me? Will you trust me? Will you praise me? It was a hard lesson. It was only the beginning of some kindergarten lessons that God was going to teach me. Are we prepared to grasp the nettle of suffering quite firmly? If we believe in the God of the Bible, we must resign ourselves to certain unresolved differences, unresolved questions, strange unpredicted things. It is blasphemy, wrote Arnold Lunn, to deny the cross. Divine suffering was not an episode but a revelation, the necessary form which divine love takes when it is brought into contact with evil. Are you scandalized by the silence of God? Who of us has not puzzled over the silence of God when he doesn't seem to be paying attention, when he doesn't seem to be giving us any answers? But he's saying to us, will you trust me? Will you obey? Will you love me? And I went back again and again to Betty Scott Stamm's prayer, work out your whole will in my life, at any cost, now and forever. And then some years later, I heard that tiny little woman called the small woman. Her name was Gladys Aylward. She was a London parlor maid, about four feet 11. I heard her speak back in about 1967 at Prairie Bible Institute in Alberta, Canada. She was sitting on the platform, wearing her Chinese dress, Mandarin collar, her hair screwed up in a tiny little knot on the top. When she stood up to speak, they had to put a box behind the pulpit so that she could, she could be seen. She was built like a toothpick, and there was no sound system in those days in that huge auditorium that held about 2,000 people, and I thought, we're not going to be able to hear a word this tiny little lady says. Well, I didn't need to worry. <laughs> she stood up, she got up on the box, and she said, I should like to read just one verse. And Jehovah God spoke to Abram and he said, get out. And Abram got out. <laughs> and she said, one day in a little flat in London, Jehovah God spoke to a London parlor maid and he said, get out. And I said, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go, Lord? And he said, to China. Well, some of you may have read the story of her going to China. <clears throat> There's a book called the, the Small Woman that tells that story. And to hear her speak and to see how tiny she was and what she had done was just another one of those ways in which God reminded me. He's got all kinds of folks. He's got all kinds of troubles and tribulations and trials, but his purpose is exactly the same, that you and I might be conformed to the image of Christ, shaped 
with the hammer, the chisel, the file, whatever it takes. Before that year was up, my first year in 1952-53, not only was there the murder of my informant, but then a very wonderful thing happened during the middle of that year. Jim Elliott, who was working way over on the other side of the Andes in the eastern jungle, after five and a half years of waiting on God, decided that God was giving him a green light to ask me to marry him. And, of course, I heaved a tremendous sigh of relief. I didn't know whether Jim was ever going to ask me to marry him, but he had given every indication that if God gave him the green light, that's what he wanted. And so he asked me to marry him, and he appended one very stringent condition to his proposal. He said, I will not marry you until you learn Quechua. Well, I'd had to learn Spanish first, then I had to learn Colorado, now I was going to have to learn Quechua. I didn't think it was too high a price to pay to get a man like Jim Elliott, and so I said yes. <laughs> Isn't that what you girls would have done? Of course. <laughs> so, but this, this meant that I had to leave the, the western jungle, go over the other Andes, over the other side of the Andes, and start at the bottom rung of a third language ladder. I hadn't been there very long, when I heard my fiancé's voice on the shortwave radio, he was on another station, and he sounded a bit agitated, and he reported that the entire station on which he had just spent a whole year rebuilding some old buildings that had fallen to pieces and building some new ones, thank you very much, he reported that the entire station had gone down the river in a flood. All the buildings, most of the contents of some of them, and once again, there was that question, why? Why would God just take one arm, as it were, and sweep everything that Jim had done off the boards? And there wasn't any answer or any echo other than, trust me. Not very many weeks after I received that radio message, I received a letter from one of my two British colleagues with whom I had left all of my Colorado language materials, they sent letter, a letter to me to tell me that all of those materials had been stolen. And those were the days before Xeroxes and tape recorders. There were no copies of anything. So literally everything that I had done in the Colorado language was swept off the board. Everything that Jim had done, more or less, as the building projects, all of that was swept off the board. And we looked up and just said, why, Lord? And the answer is, trust me. I've got the whole world in my hands. I know exactly what I'm doing, but I'm not necessarily going to explain it to you. I want you to trust me. And so God tests our faith, and it is a painful test indeed. In 2 Corinthians 1, 7, Paul writes, If we ourselves have been comforted, we know how to encourage you to endure. In 2 Corinthians 6, he speaks of the genuine ministers of God. Whatever we may have to go through, patient endurance of troubles or even disasters and being flogged. Endurance, endurance, Endurance. I have a whole page of these. You know, we don't hear that word preached about very much these days. First Thessalonians 1 says, The hope that you have in our Lord Jesus Christ means sheer, dogged endurance. I think that's probably Philip's translation. Second Thessalonians 1, You have shown such endurance and faith in all the trials and persecutions. Then there's Hebrews 12. We don't know who the writer might have been, but he speaks of eyes fixed on Jesus, who endured the cross and thought nothing of its shame because of the joy that he knew would follow. And in our very self-pampering country, the USA, where we are amusing ourselves to death, and everything's got to be fun, and everything's got to be comfortable, 
And we don't want anybody, we don't want anybody cutting across our preferences and our desires and our feelings and our emotions. And we get so terribly, unspeakably namby-pamby about ourselves, don't we? And we don't really want to hear very much about endurance. I have occasion sometimes to talk with young high school or college kids that are going off for a summer's mission trip, and they want my advice. Well, I think sometimes they're pretty sorry they asked, <laughs> because I'm likely to talk about endurance and the fact that there are going to be a whole lot of things that aren't any fun, and you're supposed to do them anyway, you're supposed to do them cheerfully, and the people there aren't going to be aren't particularly going to fall on your necks and kiss you because you're doing such wonderful things for them. There will be a whole lot of things which will not be according to your taste. You won't be able to get an ice-cold Coke any time you turn around, and you might not be able to find a place to wash your hair. But it is this very place in which God is testing you to see whether you will love Him and trust Him and praise Him, and whether you are willing to say, Anything you say, Lord, do anything you want with me. And I love that passage in James. James was a tough one, too. I like Philip's translation there. He says, when all kinds of trials and tribulations come into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. When all kinds of trials and tribulations come into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. When's the last time you did that? Realize that they come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. To produce in you the quality of endurance. But then he says, let the process go on. You know, we want to get out of it, don't we? Had enough of this. I'm up to here. Lord, I can't take any more. Who are we to tell God how much we can take? Who do we think we are? The testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Verse 7 says, That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. I'm afraid that describes too many of us. Well, it's not for nothing that God allows us to go through trials and tribulations. And when I look back on my own career as a missionary, and the various things that happened, I think, I, I really, I hardly know what suffering is by comparison with the stories that I hear, the things that are going on today in this very moment, probably. We, I hear that statistics tell us that 400 people are martyred every single day because of their faith in Jesus Christ. What do we know about these things? And I look back over my own life and I think, Lord, I don't know what suffering is by comparison. But we have to come back to the fact that God knows exactly how to measure what it takes to bring you or me into conformity to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. And so your place of bewilderment is exactly the place that God in His wisdom and mercy has chosen for you so that you will be cornered, as it were, and have nowhere to turn except up to His face. Everything that happens fits into a pattern for good to them that love God. And then it's not just for me, it's for the sake of others, isn't it, that God tests us. How could I write and tell other people about a path through suffering, for example, if God had never given me the slightest inkling of what that might be like? So all of us, in one way or another, are called to help others to see that He loves them with an everlasting love. 
and that underneath are the everlasting arms. My friend Van, she was my close friend when I was a senior in college. She went to Africa, I went to South America. We didn't see each other again for 13 years. She got kicked out by the Sudanese government because she was not uh, obeying the rules. She was not supposed to be translating the Bible into the language of the New Air people. And so the Arabs got rid of all the missionaries that were doing anything other than using Arabic. And Van was kicked out after her 13 faithful years. And she came to Ecuador and spent five months with me in the jungle. And I'll never forget that first day. We hadn't seen each other, as I said, for 13 years. And just to, to sit down and be able to talk about the dealings of God with us. And she had endless stories to tell, and I had endless stories to tell. But it all came down to the same thing. And she said to me, she always called me Bet. She said, but Bet, I just want you to know, my feet were on the rock, and the rock never moved. And I can say the same. I think of Joseph's position must have been almost impossible seeming to him. Without the wickedness of his brothers and the sovereignty of God who transforms evil, what would we know about the career of Joseph? The mystery of the sovereignty of God in allowing his brothers to treat him as they did, allowing him to be lied about, allowing him to lie in prison for who knows how many years. God knows how to transform evil and he says to us, just trust me. I know what I'm doing. I don't need to see it. I don't need to understand it. I don't need to explain it. I just need to, to trust him. And I remember a time when I was traveling, I was, happened to be in the car with my son-in-law when he had his little two-year-old in the car with him, and we went through an automatic car wash. Well, that's a pretty scary thing for the first time when you go in. And here was this little boy. Had, he had no idea what this was about. His father hadn't told him a thing. But as the roar of the water came down on top of that car and all these giant brushes, like something in a horror movie, began moving around, this little boy looked around. His eyes got big. I could see the fear in his face. But he turned to his father, to the face of his father. And when we got out of that tunnel with all the terrible noises and things that happened, this little boy's face just broke into a big smile. He did not know why we went through this. He didn't know what it was for. He didn't know if we were ever going to get out of there again. But he knew one thing. He knew his father. Do you know your Heavenly Father? Well enough to be able to trust him without explanations? St. Francis de Sales and said, He has kept us hitherto. He will take care of us tomorrow. Either he will shield us from suffering or he will give unfailing strength to bear it. And Sir Thomas Brown of the 1600s wrote, When I survey the occurrences of my life and call into account the finger of God, I can perceive nothing but an abyss and mass of mercies. Those which others term crosses, afflictions, judgments, misfortunes, to me who inquire farther into, into them than their visible effects, have ever proved the secret dissembled favors, favors of his affections. And that's my testimony. I can look back over these seven decades and when I survey the occurrences of my life and call into account the finger of God, I can perceive nothing but an abyss and mass of mercies. May God enable us to love him, to trust him, and to praise him no matter what. God bless you. I pray you've been encouraged and inspired by what you've heard today and will keep joining us here and on social media for my granny's inspiration. Until then, remember, the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms.